This is part five of the lecture series on glutamate brain damage. The first painting right here is Pandora's box. This is painted by one of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And basically Pandora is the old Greek story of when she opened up the box, she let out all these bad things because she couldn't control her curiosity. All right, and then here's another more modern painting of Pandora opening the box and all the problems floating out of there. And as usual, it's, you know, it's kind of funny. Everything is blamed on a woman. So like in Genesis, it's Eve's fault, so to speak, that she picked the apple, but Adam went along with it. And then in the Greek myth, it's also the woman's fault who stirred up all this trouble. <laughs> so it's a little bit um, picking on them. All right, so here the next thing is, I'll just share with you briefly. I'm currently reading this book called Retaining the Mind by William Wall. She's a Mayo Clinic trained allergist, fellow of the American College of Allergy, and he had food sensitivities in himself, and he got sent patients with food sensitivities. So a food sensitivity is different than a food allergy. I'm currently kind of studying allergies and sensitivities. I've been interested in this. So a food allergy is something triggered potentially by a very tiny amount of the food, and you can get this sudden onset reaction, which can be big the second or third time around. So food allergies caused by relatively big molecules can activate the allergic response system. Um, and you can easy test for these things. But food sensitivities are different. These can be activated by relatively small molecules like MSG. And basically as we get older, our enzyme systems to detoxify some of these chemicals uh, become weaker. And we can might have ate it just fine when we were 20 years old, but we get to be 40 years old and we can't detoxify it so effectively. So some of the most common food sensitivities are things like to MSG, manufactured free glutamate, um, there's other less common things that can cause food sensitivities. You can also get them to the citric acid, which can contain glutamate, <laughs> to malic acid, to lactose, you know, from milk. You can get them to the artificial sweeteners. A typical scenario is somebody ingests MSG and eats too much of it. Like let's say they ate a, a junk food frozen pizza, all right? And then they'll start getting symptoms. They might get symptoms that night. It might take a couple hours before they manifest. But they can be real bad. They can be regular headaches, migraine headaches, even really severe cluster headaches. Um, I put the page numbers for some of the stuff in here. They can get insomnia that can be severe. Some people can't sleep all night long. Some can't even sleep for two days. This author said he couldn't sleep for two days after he'd ingested a large amount of MSG. Um, trigeminal nerve irritation, that's a nerve to the face fifth cranial nerve, and um, that can be associated with nasal congestion, discharge, eye tearing, eye redness. So you wouldn't necessarily put it together, but here's where this comes into play. He found that as he got older, if he ate large amounts of MSG, he would have difficulty speaking, transient uh, dysarthria, difficulty speaking, transient difficulty with memory. And so he called it retaining his mind because he had to learn to avoid all this stuff uh, to avoid these symptoms. And some people even get some uh, bouts of diarrhea, constipation, bloating uh, from ingesting uh, too excessive an amount of MSG that their body can't handle. So uh, it's rather interesting stuff. I'm finding this book very interesting. I usually think most books are pretty straightforward, and this one actually has had a lot of new stuff that was new to me that I thought was real helpful. Okay, so if you've got problems with food sensitivities or food allergy, I'm liking this book. I'll do a separate book report on it sometime soon. Okay, here's just a reminder that blood-brain barrier is protected by the same short-chain fatty acids that are microbiota-derived, meaning that they come from uh, converting the dietary fiber into butyrate, okay? So the same thing that protects the gut from leaky gut protects the brain, blood-brain barrier from leaky blood-brain barrier. It's an important point. You need to know that. Okay, there's no fiber in animal foods, no fiber in oils. Okay, you can get activation of um, your microglia. These are the big macrophage, immune system, defense cells in the body. So just having leaky gut leads to bacterial endotoxins in the blood, LPS, lipopolysaccharide from gram-negative bacteria, LTA, lipotychoic acid from gram-positive bacteria. Those can get into the brain, and they can, with, you know, across leaky blood-brain barrier, and they can activate your microglia cells. When the microglia are activated, they start secreting things that can be really toxic and dangerous. They can be harmful cytokines, but it can also activate the inose, inducible nitric oxide synthase, and it starts releasing tons of this nitric oxide gas. It diffuses into your neurons and can produce, combined with peroxynitrite, combined with superoxides in your mitochondria and produce peroxynitrite, and that can finish off the neuron and damage it. So you don't want this happening. This is really bad. 
Martin Paul write, wrote about this and how he thinks this is contributing to a lot of major neurologic diseases. Okay, this is just another paper uh, talking about the same thing, blood-brain barrier related to high-fiber diet, production of short-chain fatty acids. And if you don't get this, you screw up your blood-brain barrier and you don't want to do that. Okay, high-fat diets also can, are, tend to cause brain fog. They make animals stupid, and guess what? They make humans stupid, too. Okay, this is just another paper showing you feed a high-fat diet to a mouse, it becomes stupid. Can't do little mouse tasks very well. Another paper. There's three papers. Click, 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 click. High-fat diet, cognitive impairment. <laughs> so that's why I laugh at these paleo-keto carnivores, you know, trying to say there's something good about their stupid diet. They're slowing down their brains and becoming stupider, and they're so stupid they don't even know it. Okay, um, EMF can also have some effect to open up blood-brain barrier a little bit. It can open up voltage-gated calcium channels. It can decrease cognitive function. Um, avoid it to the extent you can. Uh, this is another paper, you know, an old paper, 1975. It's been known a long time that radio frequency can uh, open up blood-brain barrier permeability. Um, this is just more papers showing the same thing that uh, increased EMF can open up blood-brain barrier. Um, and it also can be toxic to mitochondria. Same thing here. Oh, psychological stress can be rather toxic as well. Excessive psychological stress can start leading to activation of microglia, putting them into an inflammatory phase, like becoming an M1 microglia. They'll retract their you know, outer projectile things, their original resting phase. They look like an octopus, but when they retract those, they then can become a secretory microglia. The M1 type of microglia is bad and releases inflammatory cytokines. The M2 one is protective, it's the good one. But the whole point I wanted to make is excessive psychological stress can do this. It can also increase risk of epilepsy, of course. Okay, this is, I, I don't really want to get into this. I had another, uh, oh, this is just showing that uh, smartphone devices can increase activation of neurons, can have a small contributory effect towards epilepsy from overstimulating neurons. You can, uh, through electromagnetic radiation, open up that trip V1 channel as well as the voltage-gated calcium channels, and that can cause um, increased activation of neurons. You don't want that. You just put a, a phone over uh, cells and tissue culture, and uh, the neurons are more vulnerable to apoptosis death due to the constant ongoing EMF. Mitochondrial dysfunction has a link to acquired epilepsy. Yeah, because you can't, you don't, can't make enough ATP to pump out your calcium. Okay, my theory, one of my theories in neurodegeneration, the Rogers theory, here's a mnemonic for it, Rosie. Rogers theory, OGD, stimulants, inhibitors of mitochondria. Uh, basically, you get neurovascular uncoupling. You can call, I call it the supply and demand theory. So you got baseline metabolic rate of a neuron, you got oxygen and glucose delivery, and you have to couple them, meaning make them the same. So that's why I also can call it supply and demand. I also call it the overworked and, and underpaid theory. So the bottom line is your neuron needs enough oxygen and glucose that it can meet its metabolic demands. If you drop the oxygen and glucose level due to overtreated hypertension, AFib, congestive heart failure, aortic regurgitation, aortic stenosis, you're going to widen this gap, potential problems for that neuron. And you make it worse if you give stimulants, you know, caffeine, sleep deprivation, psychological stress. Um, now you're widening the gap or amphetamines, cocaine, that you might not get enough energy delivery there. Um, you can worsen it well with you have mitochondrial inhibitors, circuit inhibitors, volatile organic chemicals. Um, all of these things make it worse. High fat diet leading to increased beta amyloid protein and these other causes. And then when this gap gets too wide between the metabolic rate of the neuron and the oxygen and glucose being able to be delivered and the ability to produce ATP from mitochondria, this gap gets too wide, this neuron just dies. And that's how people lose tons of neurons and become demented eventually over the course of decades of having that happen. Uh, antioxidants are your friend. You get these guys from plants. You can just conceptualize it that if a person was out in the hot sun, they're going to walk under a tree for shade. The plant can't do it. The plant has to fight back and prevent oxidative damage by its antioxidant chemicals. When you eat the plant, you get them. You don't get them from eating an animal because it's already used them up. Um, leaky blood-brain barrier causes all kinds of problems for the brain because you get toxic chemicals in there. You can't run your uh, action potentials as efficiently as you like. The bottom line is, you know, if you avoid these toxins and you eat the healthy food, low-fat vegan diet, 
you keep your Johnson working, you'll avoid pills and surgeries, and you probably live to about 90, early 90s, everything else being equal. Um, on the other hand, typical American, you know, they, they're fat by their late 30s, early 40s. They just get fatter and sicker by 50s. They're hypertensive, diabetic, pre-diabetic, take pills, pill, 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 drug, drug, drug. The drugs don't work so well because it's a dietary disease. The only way to cure dietary disease is fix the diet. So when you have a dietary disease and you just keep progressing on these pills that don't work, you end up going for surgery. Chop, 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 bye-bye money, dead prematurely like around 70, late 60s. Okay, and that's it for uh, part five of um, part five of how glutamate causes brain damage. I hope that was helpful.